In this lesson, we will continue our discussion of homomorphisms by presenting and proving several isomorphism theorems. So first, let's recall that if G is a group and we have a normal subgroup N of G, then the quotient group G mod N, which we first define as the set of left cosets of N and G, So this set of cosets actually forms a group under the operation G1N times G, G2N equals G1, G2N. So this is called the quotient group or the factor group of G mod N. So given any homomorphism, we've already shown that the kernel of that homomorphism is a normal subgroup. Now we'll show that every normal subgroup can actually be written as the kernel of a homomorphism. So there's gonna be a very special homomorphism that we'll use later. Let's call this a theorem. So let N be a normal subgroup. then N is the kernel of the natural homomorphism. So that's the name of this homomorphism, the natural homomorphism. Sometimes called the canonical homomorphism or simply the projection homomorphism. So we have this special homomorphism. We're gonna give the name pi, which comes from the word projection. So pi maps from G to G mod N and is defined by pi of g, an element in the group, equals the left coset g n. So this is called the natural homomorphism. So we just map any element of g to its corresponding left coset g n when n is a normal subgroup. So for the proof, and be a normal subgroup of G. Then first we need to show that pi is a homomorphism. So to see this, given any X and Y in this, the group G, pi of XY equals XY times n, but by the operation in g mod n, this equals xn times yn, which is pi of x times pi of y. So pi is a homomorphism. Second, we show that n is equal to the kernel of this homomorphism. So let's see this, that N is the, actually the kernel. G is in the kernel of this homomorphism, if and only if 
gn, which is pi of g, equals the identity in g over n. Well, the identity in g over n is just n. But gn equals n if and only if g is in the normal subgroup n, which we proved when we had our lesson on left cosets. gn equals n precisely when g is an element of n. So we've just shown that n equals the kernel of this natural homomorphism pi. So since kernels of homomorphisms are normal subgroups, and we just showed that any normal subgroup n is the kernel of some homomorphism, we see that the ideas of normal subgroups and kernels of homomorphisms coincide. Next, we will prove an important theorem called the fundamental theorem of group homomorphisms. So for this theorem, let's let phi be a homomorphism from G to H, where G and H are groups. Then there is a unique homomorphism call it phi bar that maps from the quotient group G mod kernel phi to H such that phi equals phi bar composed with our natural homomorphism pi. So this is often represented by the following diagram. So we can have the group G and elements of G are mapped to H by the homomorphism phi. Well, this theorem says that I can first map G via the homomorphism pi. You map elements of G to G mod kernel of phi because kernel phi is a normal subgroup. So G mod kernel phi is a group. And then there's a unique function that then maps to H and this function we call phi bar. We say the diagram commutes So that is the image in H of an element in G does not depend on the path taken in the diagram. So let's prove the fundamental theorem of group, group homomorphisms. So first consider the homomorphism pi. Since pi from G to G mod kernel of phi It maps an element little g in the group to g kernel of phi. So we must define phi bar 
from gmod kernel of phi to h by phi bar of g kernel phi. This has to be equal to phi of g. In order for the diagram to commute, in order for phi to equal phi bar composed with pi, this must be the definition. So we've defined this homomorphism phi bar, phi bar of g kernel phi equals phi of g. Now we need to show that phi bar is well defined. That is, the correspondence is independent of the particular coset representative chosen. But we need to show that even if we have different representatives, the image in H is still the same. So we now show that phi bar is well defined. In other words, the correspondence that defines phi bar is independent of the particular coset representative chosen. So let's suppose we have two different coset representatives. So A kernel of phi equals B kernel phi. So these are the same cosets with different representatives. Well, we've shown that this is true if and only if A inverse B is an element of kernel of phi. But by definition of the kernel, this means that phi of A inverse B has to equal the identity in H. It's called 1H. Well, by the properties of homomorphism, this is true if and only if phi of A inverse phi of B equals the identity. And this is true if and only if phi of A inverse phi of B equals the identity. But then I can multiply both sides of this equation on the left by phi of A, and we get that phi of B equals phi of A. So we see that it doesn't matter which representative of the coset is chosen, we would still end up with the same image. So now we see that phi bar is well defined. Now let's show that phi bar is a homomorphism. So we see that phi bar of A kernel phi times B kernel phi would be the same as phi bar of AB kernel phi, which equals phi of AB. And then by properties of phi, this equals phi of A, phi of B, which equals phi bar of A kernel phi times phi bar of B kernel phi. So there we've shown that phi bar is a homomorphism and from our first statement of this proof, we saw that there's only one way we could have defined phi bar. So the uniqueness of phi bar
falls from the requirement that phi equals phi bar composed with pi. And so there's no other way we could have defined this homomorphism, phi bar of g kernel of phi, which equals phi bar of pi of g. This has to equal of g in order for this composition equation to be true. And so that finishes the fundamental theorem of group homomorphisms. So we've shown that there's a unique group homomorphism phi bar such that phi equals phi bar composed with pi given any homomorphism phi. Now we will list three important theorems called the isomorphism theorems, which are actually corollaries of the fundamental theorem of group homomorphisms. So first, let me state these corollaries, these isomorphism theorems. So the first isomorphism theorem So let phi be a homomorphism from groups G to H. So the first isomorphism theorem tells us that G mod kernel of phi is isomorphic to the image of G, phi of the group G. So this tells us that the homomorphic image of G is structurally identical, that is isomorphic, to the set of cosets of kernel phi in G. So now let's state the second isomorphism theorem. The second isomorphism theorem starts off with A and B subgroups of a group G with a, actually e, a normal subgroup of G. Then we will show that the set AB is a subgroup of G. A intersect B is a normal subgroup of B. A is a normal subgroup of AB and the isomorphic statement goes like this b mod a intersect b is isomorphic to a b mod a so the third isomorphism theorem considers taking quotient groups of quotient groups So let H and K be normal subgroups of G with H being a subgroup of K. Then we'll show that K mod H is a normal subgroup of G mod H and if we take the quotient group of these quotient groups, we get G mod H mod K mod H. And this is isomorphic to the quotient group G mod K. So now we're going to prove these isomorphism theorems before we state the fourth isomorphism theorem. Let's begin the proof of one. So 
So we're going to apply the fundamental theorem of group homomorphisms And note that if phi equals phi bar composed with pi, and phi bar, which maps from g mod kernel phi to not all of h, but if I map just to phi of g, then this homomorphism is an isomorphism. To show that it is onto, if phi of a little g is in the image of g, And phi bar of g kernel phi equals phi bar of pi of g, and that is equal to phi of g. So phi bar of g kernel phi maps to phi of g. So thus phi bar is onto when it's mapping to phi of g. And to show that it's one to one, assume that phi bar of a kernel phi equals phi bar of b kernel phi. We need to show that these inputs are the same. Well, that implies that phi of a equals phi of b, just by definition of phi bar, and phi of a equals phi of b implies that a kernel phi equals b kernel phi. So we showed this last implication in our lesson about group homomorphisms phi of a equals phi of b, if and only if a kernel phi equals b kernel phi. Thus, phi bar is one to one. So we have an isomorphism phi bar from g mod kernel phi onto phi of g. Thus, g mod kernel phi is actually isomorphic to V of G. So again, this says that the homomorphic image of G is structurally identical to the quotient group G mod kernel phi, the set of cosets of kernel phi and G. Now for the proof of the second isomorphism theorem. We're going to assume that A is a normal subgroup of G and B is a subgroup of G. First, we're gonna show that AB is a subgroup of G. And we're gonna show this by showing that AB equals BA. And then we had a theorem we already proved that AB is a subgroup exactly when AB equals BA. So let A be in group A and B be in group B. Since A is a normal subgroup of G, the element B, A, B inverse must be an element of A. But then I can write the element B, A 
as B A B inverse B because the B inverse and B would cancel. And so this must be an element of the group AB. So I've just shown that any arbitrary element BA is an element of the set AB. Thus BA is a subset of AB. Then to show the reverse containment, to see that AB, which I can write as B, B inverse AB, this must be an element of BA, again, because B inverse AB is in A, since A is normal. Thus we have the reverse containment, AB contained in BA. So this shows that AB equals BA, and AB is a subgroup of G. Therefore, AB is a subgroup of G. Now since A is a normal subgroup of G, A must also be a normal subgroup of the subgroup AB. Now we consider the map call it phi first take an element of B and then every element of B is an element of a B by just the identity mapping so B little B is mapped to little B in a B because the the identity is an a so therefore, the identity times little b is an element of AB. And then we're going to use the projection mapping, pi, to take this element b and map it onto a left coset of AB mod A. So little b it gets mapped by the projection mapping to little b times the kernel, which is A. So this map phi takes the element of B and maps it to a left coset BA. So we're going to define V of B to equal little b A. And this again is for any little b in set B. Now we look at this map and, and we see that phi is actually a group homomorphism. And to see that, phi of xy which equals xy times a. But since a is normal, I can write this as xa ya, which is equal to phi of x times phi of y. So we see that phi is a group homomorphism and phi is actually onto. So that is phi maps elements of group B onto the quotient group AB over A. And to see this, let x a be an arbitrary left coset of a b mod a well, then x must equal little a little b for some little a in a and little b in b So then, the left coset xa equals 
a b a but I can write this by multiplying on the left by b b inverse we see this is b b inverse a b times a but recall a is normal so b inverse a b is an element of group a so it's absorbed by this group a so this just equals b a which is phi of b so we see that any left set of a b over a is equal to phi of b for some b in group b so phi is onto so just to reiterate we see that phi of b is all of a b mod a so the image of phi is equal to a b mod a now let's look at the kernel of this homomorphism so the kernel of this homomorphism would be the set of elements little b and b such that phi of b equals the identity So written another way, we can see this is the set of little b and b such that b a equals a because phi of b is b a and the identity in a b over a is the left coset a. Then this equals the set of b in group b such that b is an a and we notice and recognize this as a intersect B. So the kernel of phi is the group A intersect B. Since A intersect B is a kernel, A intersect B is a normal subgroup of B. And by the first isomorphism theorem, We have that B mod A intersect B must be isomorphic to A B mod A. So this establishes the second isomorphism theorem. Now for the proof of the third isomorphism theorem, which again is a theorem about quotient groups of quotient groups. So let H and K be normal subgroups of G. And further, we're assuming that H is a subgroup of K. Then we're gonna use the natural homomorphism again. So now we're gonna use the natural homomorphism pi from g to g mod k. Again, pi is defined by pi of g equals the left coset at g k. Then the kernel of this projection map is k. And H is a subgroup of K. So H is a subgroup of the kernel of pi. So now we're going to define another natural homomorphism. I'm gonna call this one pi sub H. Now this projection map maps from G to G mod H. And again, we're gonna define this by, again, the natural projection mapping. So pi sub H of G equals the left coset G H. 
Then we're going to use the fundamental theorem of group homomorphisms. Pi factors as pi bar composed with pi h or pi bar actually maps from g mod h to g mod k and this map pi bar is defined by pi bar of the left coset gh will equal the left coset gk. So again, we have this original map g being mapped onto g mod k by the map pi. And we can factor this by the map pi h, which takes elements of g to the left cosets in g mod h. And then we have the, the map pi bar, which takes that element and maps it to g mod k. So we have pi equals pi bar composed with pi h. Then we claim that pi bar is onto. So let's take a arbitrary left coset G K in G mod K. Then G K equals pi bar of G H. So pi bar is on two. And let's look at the kernel of pi bar. The kernel of pi bar is the set of all left cosets a h such that a k equals k. But the only way that a k can equal k is if a is an element of k. So this is the left coset, the set of left cosets a h such that A is in K, but this is just the set of cosets of H and K. So this equals K mod H, which is the set of left cosets of H and K. So we see that K mod H is equal to the kernel of pi bar. Thus, K mod H must be a normal subgroup of G mod H. And by the first isomorphism theorem, we have G mod H mod K mod H. So we have this set G mod H mod its kernel under the homomorphism pi bar. This is isomorphic to the image of pi bar, which we showed is all of G mod K. So that finishes the third isomorphism theorem. And this final statement, you can think of it as similar to canceling a complex fraction. So when we divide one fraction by another, you invert the bottom fraction and cancel. So this theorem shows us that no new structural information is gained by taking quotients of quotient groups. We see that G mod H mod K mod H is isomorphic to G mod K. Now finally, we'll state but not prove the final isomorphism theorem
This is sometimes called the lattice isomorphism theorem because it describes the relationship between lattices of G and lattices of G mod N for a normal subgroup. So the statement is let G be a group with N being a normal subgroup of G, then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the set of subgroups of G containing N and the set of subgroups of G mod N. This is often called the lattice isomorphism theorem. Because it tells us that the lattice of subgroups of G mod N. More precisely, the isomorphic copy of the lattice of subgroups of G mod N. This actually appears in the lattice of subgroups of G. as a collection of subgroups of G between N and G. So as a quick example, consider the lattice of subgroups for the quaternions, Q8. So we have Q8 on top, and we have subgroups, subgroup generated by I, the subgroup generated by J, and the subgroup generated by K below Q8. And then below that is the subgroup generated by negative one, which is a subgroup of the three group subgroups above it. And then finally we have the trivial subgroup containing only the identity below. The cyclic subgroup generated by negative one is a normal subgroup of Q8. And the isomorphic copy of the lattice for Q8 mod the cyclic subgroup generated by negative one is above the subgroup generated by negative one in this lattice. So I'm going to denote it by double lines. So I'm gonna go back and draw double lines to, to indicate the 
isomorphic copy of the Lattice 4 Q8 mod, the cyclic suburb generated by negative 1. So we have above it, we'll put double lines. So this example shows how you can find the lattice of a quotient group G mod N by looking at the lattice of subgroups of G. So to summarize the last few lessons, we see that we use homomorphisms, quotient groups, and isomorphism theorems to study the structures of groups. The idea is if we have enough information about some normal subgroup N of a group G and enough information about the quotient group G mod N, then we can piece together this information to gain information about the structure of the group G. So this idea, all of these theorems depend on the fact that we have a non-trivial normal subgroup of G. So groups without non-trivial normal subgroups must be studied in other ways. And these are a special type of groups which are called simple groups. So this leads to the following definition. A group G is called simple if the order of G is greater than one and the only normal subgroups of G are the trivial normal subgroups, the subgroup containing the identity and the group G itself. So since simple groups do not have a non-trivial normal subgroup, the idea is that they can't be factored into pieces like N and G mod N. And so they're kind of analogous to the primes in the set of integers. So now that we've defined simple groups, for a good laugh, search in YouTube for the music video, A Finite Simple Group of Order 2, by the mathematical quartet called the Klein 4 Group.